us is Aotearoa, a land that defines us as a people, a land that needs our care. We are kaitiaki of this whenua, its past and its future, guardians of its unique biology. Because our land is our future. Tōtātou whenua moa pōpō. We are Manaki whenua. Tēhei mōri ora. E mi tuatahi ki te atua, te orua ki nga mate. Haere, haere, haere. Tene mehi nui ki te mano whanua. Tēna koutou, tēna koutou, tēna koutou katoa. I'm Richard Gordon. I'm the Chief Executive of Manaki Whanua Land Care Research and I'm delighted to be here. I'm going to speak quickly because I've got three things to do and I don't want to take any more time away from our next speaker than is absolutely necessary. I just want to say a few words on behalf of Manaki Fenwa as the partner of this fantastic event and also the host of the challenge. Um, just to say a few things about this wonderful challenge and uh, also to introduce theme three, Whakaho Restoration and our first speaker in this theme. So as Manaki Fenwa, one of the Crown Research Institutes, and uh, we've been around since 1992, but of course our history goes back a lot further than, than that. Um, this is our vision. Uh, it talks about all the realms of the forest, cultivated land and uncultivated land flourishing. We have four ambitions for New Zealand. Two of them align absolutely with this challenge, and the other two are very relevant as well. So our biodiversity and our biosecurity work um, amount to more than half of our, the total of, of what we do, and that's a, a very significant amount of research. We've probably got the largest groups of researchers in New Zealand in those areas. New programs, for example, um, with birds, led by Susan Walker um, out of our Dunedin office, very very relevant. A new program with Maori, uh, sorry, with myrtle rust disease, led by Madge Padency, out of Auckland, again very very relevant. A wide range of programs. We also curate uh, national collections, national plant collection, national fungal collection, invertebrates, microbes associated with plants also national databases, National Vegetation Survey database goes back decades, um, SOARS databases and so on. So tremendous resources. This is one of the things about the CRIs. They have the capacity, they have the resources. We need to protect those. Um, we align 16 million per year of our research with the challenge. That's probably the biggest single alignment and it just reflects the fact that our goals map exactly onto the goals of this challenge. We've in, been investing for the last couple of decades in Māori research. We still don't have enough, but we're very proud of the Māori researchers that we have. Um, we've been investing in economic and social research, and we've heard this morning about the, the real importance of social research and how that needs to, to grow, because this is a people issue first and foremost. Um, we've been fantastically well, I mean, I'm, I'm just very excited that over the last couple of years we've been able to take on a, at least another 50 five zero scientists uh, into our organisation. Many of those have come from overseas. Some are Māori, many are young, many are women, many all sorts. Great diversity. So just reflecting on Andrea's comment, um, it, it, it's great to see that diversity growing within the organisation because it brings so much value to the whole of New Zealand. Um, so we're, we're a natural and proud host of this challenge and very strong supporter. Uh, we share the values of partnership for impact that um, Andrea talked about and are in the, 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 
title page of, of the report that you've got. Um, we see the challenge breaking down silos, really important in our very complex science environment. We see the, the challenge getting great teams together, new teams um, involving people overseas as well as people in New Zealand involving community groups. Um, that's, that's not an easy thing to do, and I think everybody in this room appreciates that it, that's not easy, but that's absolutely essential to bring great teams together because individually we can't achieve impact on our own. Um, the challenge is nurturing diversity and young people coming into science and young people just coming into the challenge, whether they're from communities, from schools or whatever. And I'll come back to that point in a moment, but that nurturing of diversity and of the young are really, really important aspects of this challenge. I want to introduce theme three, Whakaho Restoration. Um, I don't need to explain that here, but um, we're looking forward to hearing from Rochelle Binney, who is the first speaker. Um, I'll just reflect back 20 odd years. Some people in the room may have been there. Um, I was involved in a restoration ecology program forced, funded by Forced. And uh, we had a conference which we called Restoring the Health and Wealth of Ecosystems. We held it in Christchurch. We had a video link to the Society of Ecological Restoration who were holding their annual conference in Texas. And the point I'm making is that was 20 years ago. Some of us have been around for a long time. We, we really need new blood coming in, new diversity. And Rochelle would have been at school in those days. So I'm absolutely delighted, something that she would probably not have considered at all when she was at school, that she would be coming up in a couple of seconds to give a keynote speech at a conference like this in New Zealand, and you'll hear that she's from Scotland. Uh, uh, so she's a, a, an exemplar of um, new blood coming into science, coming into our organisation, and doing incredibly well, and being an example to others like her. So. Give a big hand, please, to Rochelle. Tēnā koutou katoa. Nō Scotland ahau, kē otau tahi ahau e, e naha ana. E, ko Rochelle Benny tōku ingoa. And kia ora Richard for the, for the introduction. I think I'm pushing the wrong button. Oh, there we go. So our theme so far this morning has been tiaki or protect, but now I'd like to shift gear slightly and start us thinking more about whakahau or restoration. With all this talk about killing predators, I think it's important that we don't lose sight of our, our ultimate goal here, which is to restore New Zealand's uh, indigenous ecosystems. So yesterday and this morning, we had a couple of questions around, do we actually know what impact our predator control in New Zealand is having for our indigenous ecosystems? And I've been wriggling and hopping up and down in my seat um, because that is exactly the question that I hope I can answer for us today. So how can we set the scene for a predator-free Aotearoa? How can we start to set realistic expectations for what biodiversity impacts we're going to have from the predator control that we're doing. Uh, so today, first of all, what I'd like to talk about is, is the theme of our symposium, how can we partner for impact? Among our communities and our eco-sanctuaries and our agencies, we have a wealth of knowledge and experience, so how can we really bring all this experience together uh, to really stand us in the best possible stead towards achieving our ultimate goal of being predator-free? I'll talk a little bit about the different um, common predator control regimes that we have in New Zealand. Um, and these range from suppression all the way through to eradication. So they have different targets in terms of what they're trying to achieve with their pest control. And finally, I, I wanna think a little bit about how we can use our past and our current restoration to really help us come up with a strategy for where we're going with our future restoration. So here are four of our, our quite common predator control regimes in New Zealand. So first of all, up on the top left, we have ring fence sanctuaries. So these are sanctuaries like Zealandia here in Wellington, where the goal is really uh, eradication. All pests except mice are eradicated from inside the sanctuary. And then a pest resistant fence uh, encircles the sanctuary uh, and does a pretty good job of preventing reinvasion, but they do get the very odd invader coming in. 
Then down on your bottom left, we have fenced peninsulas. Again, here the goal is eradication. Um, there's a pest-resistant fence at the neck of the peninsula. But in this case, we've got a slightly higher reinvasion uh, risk. Pests can leak around the coastal edges of the, of the peninsula fence. Uh, so staff inside these sanctuaries are constantly having to contend uh, with reinvasion. Uh, then up in the top right, we have uh, unfenced mainland islands. So these are sites like our dock mainland islands, but also a huge number that are run by community groups uh, and other agencies. And here the goal isn't to eradicate, but instead to suppress. Uh, and actually the number of pests that remain in these sites um, after uh, sustained trapping and bait station, um, baiting can actually range quite widely, but we can actually learn quite a lot from this, as, as I'll come to later. Uh, and then finally, down in the bottom right, we have um, a fourth regime, large-scale possum-focused control. So this is uh, the likes of docks battle for our birds um, uh, and, and large-scale um, TB-free, run by osprey-type um, control. And again, the goal is to suppress but not eradicate. And we can almost split this into two regimes for aerial operations uh, versus ground-based um, operations as well. So across our, our eco-sanctuaries in New Zealand is this huge wealth of knowledge. And as well as controlling predators and restoring ecosystems, uh, these amazing sanctuaries are also monitoring everything. They're monitoring biodiversity, they're monitoring pests. So to try and start to answer these really big questions around what impact is our predator control having for biodiversity, uh, we really needed to partner for impact. So this is our, our theme over these two days. Uh, and this work would not be possible without building a partnership across these sanctuaries. So we reached out to um, Sanctuaries of New Zealand and also to DOC, uh, DOC's mainland islands. And we asked what has been measured where in our sanctuaries in Aotearoa uh, and how much of this data might be available to be shared for a big analysis uh, of ecosystem restoration. And the response we got was absolutely overwhelming. So we ended up with this amazing database of biodiversity monitoring data uh, from sites across the country, over 1 million records, uh, 26 sites, a whole different um, range of different types of sanctuaries, uh, spanning 25 years of monitoring, which is a huge testament uh, to all the hard work of sanctuaries staff, and a whole different range of uh, types of species as well. So it certainly at this point felt very ambitious and very crazy. <laughs> So we have all, all three different types of eco-sanctuaries um, have contributed data for this, this big national analysis. And here we can see they're spread across both islands. And when we look at the pest monitoring data uh, just for one key pest target, for, so for ship rats, uh, we can see this kind of confirms what we were um, looking at in terms of eradication versus suppression. So in our ring fence sanctuaries, when we look at ship rats, eradication is, is pretty successful, and that means our rats track at about 0%. When we look at fenced peninsulas, we have the occasional reinvader to contend with. So occasionally, we get a, a slight increase up to about 10% in our rodent tracking. And finally, unfenced mainland islands actually can have quite a huge uh, variability in the number of um, ship rats that are inside the sanctuary. But this is actually something that can be very informative, um, as we'll see quite soon. So as well as using a whole variety of, of types of control methods, um, we also have a whole range of biodiversity, biodiversity monitoring methods that are used inside our sanctuaries. Uh, and with all this, this, these different types of information, we really needed a way of clearing a path through all this clutter and coming up with one single universal measure of biodiversity that we could use to compare across sites and over time uh, and look at exactly how biodiversity was responding to pest control. And we did this using a technique called meta-analysis. I won't go into too much of the technical details around um, how meta-analysis works, other than to say it's, it's becoming an increasingly common method used in the field of ecology, and it, it does allow you to um, come up with this big single measure um, of biodiversity outcome. Okay, so I'm a mathematician, I love graphs, I appreciate it's not everyone's cup of tea, but I'll, I'll take you through this one. Um, so this is exactly what we, we did, is we pulled all this information together to try and come up with one universal biodiversity measure. And what this graph shows, I'll, I'll explain first the, the bottom axis, is control duration. So the number of years that we've been doing pest control inside a sanctuary. Uh, and I should say this is all of our eco-sanctuary data combined, first of all. Uh, and on this vertical axis, we have what's called an effect size. And this is our, our single measure of biodiversity. 
So if you can see the dashed line at zero, this indicates uh, that the pest control we're doing is having no effect. Anything above that line is a biodiversity benefit, so a positive response to predator control. Um, anything below the line uh, is a negative response, so that would be species declining as a result of us doing pest control. And just to give you a sense of the scale here, um, if we went up to about a value of 0 0.7, that would indicate that our populations had doubled on account of doing pest control. So that's quite a sizable um, increase. And then the points here are these effect sizes, um, these measures of biodiversity impacts. And as we can see, for, if we look at our bird populations in this graph, we see an amazing increase in the biodiversity uh, on account of doing pest control. The most rapid increase happens in about the first five years or so, but even 15, 16 years on, we're still seeing an increase. Uh, I should say the error bars indicate how much certainty we have in these estimates, so how confident we are uh, in the estimate. And you can see for some points that's actually quite large. Uh, and finally, I've shaded these last few points in grey. Uh, the reason being, we only had a couple of very long-term studies available, so it's unlikely that this dip in biodiversity that, that we see actually reflects a true dip. Um, it's just that we need more data, more of those long-term studies. And we did a similar thing for invertebrates and for vegetation. So you can see that on the whole, we get really great biodiversity responses for these two different um, taxonomic groups. But there wasn't a much, uh, weren't as many invertebrate studies um, or as much vegetation um, being monitored as for birds. So we do have quite large uncertainty around those measures. So then we wanted to ask, OK, this is all of our eco-sanctuary um, outcome combined, but could we tease apart the different regimes that we talked about, these different sanctuary types? And that's what we did next. So here, um, first of all, I'll draw your attention to the, the red circles. So first of all, looking at the restoration trajectories for ring fence sanctuaries. And as you can see, we have amazing biodiversity benefits, particularly for our bird populations up at the top there. Peninsula, peninsula fence sanctuaries, where again we've eradicated, but we have the odd reinvader, we still see amazing increases, but to a slightly lesser degree. Uh, and lastly, our unfenced sites, where the goal is suppression, not eradication, we still see really great benefits, um, but slightly less so than our ring fence sanctuaries, which is what we would expect. And again, for invertebrates and for vegetation, we also see great increases. But you can start to see where we're missing um, certain types of information, particularly around peninsula fence sanctuaries for these two groups. So now I want to think just a bit about um, our bird populations in more detail, uh, and particularly, particularly about our endemic species. So these are um, New Zealand bird species that are found nowhere else in the world, only in New Zealand. Uh, and we can almost group species um, into depths of endemicity, so different levels of, of how endemic they are, based on how long they've been found in New Zealand. So if we go to the, the very middle of this circle here, to our very deepest endemic species, our most iconic species that are found nowhere else in the world, these are our kiwi species. They've been around for a really, really long time. As you go out towards the edge of this circle, we, can, um, we have more recent endemic species that aren't found anywhere else in the world, but they might have um, some genetically similar cousins, maybe um, elsewhere, perhaps Australia. And these are species like our honey eaters, uh, our komako, um, and our tui. And then actually you can go outside the circle as well and look at species that aren't endemic, but they are native to New Zealand, uh, but are also found elsewhere in the world. And also our introduced species like our blackbirds too. So we wanted to ask, do these different endemic groups, um, how do they respond to predator control? And do they respond any better than these recent natives? And it turns out that the data shows quite clearly that they do. So I'll draw your attention first um, to this red line, which shows our trajectory for our very deep endemics. So species like our hihi are showing the greatest, most positive response to predator control. Uh, and it, they're also, also showing the fastest response there too. Then if we go to the, the bottom two lines, this blue and purple line, these are our recent natives and our introduced species, which actually don't do so well. And they actually lie below the dashed line, so they, they actually decline on account of doing pest control. And then our more recent endemics, so species like our honey eaters, they still have an amazing benefits, but to a slightly lesser degree uh, than our very deep endemic, um, hihi and kiwi. So I think it's amazing that the, the data shows us that so clearly. Uh, and that we've got these trajectories going up to over 15 years. 
Now, I just want to look at one snapshot in time, uh, seven years since we started control, and start to have a think about, um, given that we have all our eco-sanctuary data in here, can we start to think about what effect the differences in how many pests are left at these sites, what impact that might have for the biodiversity there. And that's what I've done here. So um, what these graphs are showing is how sensitive different um, endemic groups are to any pests that remain. Now, I've just gone with one key pest, ship rats, so I've switched out our bottom axis here for the number of ship rats that are left in a sanctuary or ship rat tracking rate. Uh, and again, we have this measure of biodiversity on the vertical axis. And the steepness of the slope of these lines indicates just how vulnerable a group of species are uh, to any ship rats that are remaining. And if we look first of all at the red line, we have a really steep downward curve, which is telling us that these really deep endemics are the most sensitive species um, to even small increases in ship rats that remain in a sanctuary. If you look across to the other side, to our introduced species, we've got a slightly flatter slope there, uh, which is kind of saying these species um, are fairly insensitive to any changes in, in pests that remain. And then in the middle, we have our, our more recent endemics, um, which are sensitive, um, but to a slightly lesser degree than species like our hihi. And what's really important about being able to draw these kind of uh, results is that you can start to come up with quite clear um, thresholds for what pest abundance you need to achieve in order to deliver a good um, and desired outcome for your biodiversity. So we can start to say this is the level uh, of ship rats that we need to get down to to see the outcome that we want to see inside our sanctuary. And finally, we, we don't just care about birds, we want to care about bugs as well. Um, here I'm again looking across all our different types of eco-sanctuaries, uh, and I'm not thinking about how endemic a different um, invertebrates are, um, but just looking at um, different orders of invertebrates, uh, and I'm not looking over time, so I've, I've kind of switched the graph here. So our effect size on the bottom, everything to the right of the dash line is now our positive uh, benefit to biodiversity, and everything to the left is a negative response to biodiversity. Uh, sorry, to predator control. <laughs> Uh, and I've just highlighted in red um, three of our kind of iconic uh, large-bodied invertebrates. Um, so down in the bottom, we can see that we get really great benefits from predator control uh, to Weta, uh, and also to some of our native um, snail species, things like Poelophanta po uh, do really well. Um, but others don't do so well, and we're not exactly sure why that is yet, but we do have some ideas. And these are things like our, our native beetles. And finally, I promised I'd come back to um, thinking about this large-scale possum-focused um, control and how that compares to the types of control we see inside our sanctuaries. Uh, and that's exactly what we've done here. Again, our graphs are flipped, so everything to the right of the line is a biodiversity benefit, and everything to the left is saying biodiversity is um, declining. Uh, and we can see that our possum-focused control um, does give benefits to biodiversity as well, but to a slightly lesser degree uh, than we would have in, in sanctuaries, which is what we would expect. Uh, if you look at invertebrates and veg, it looks like the ground-based operations might be um, giving slightly better benefits compared to the aerial control, um, but on the whole, things are looking really good from all four of these regimes. So to just try and wrap all this up, what are some of the, the key take-home messages um, from, from this big analysis? Well, this has been the first synthesis of biodiversity outcomes across four of New Zealand's um, predator control regimes. Five, if we think of this possum-focused regime, as being aerial control uh, and ground-based operations. And we've seen that predator control is benefiting biodiversity, so I hope we've um, started to, to tick that and ask, answer that question. Uh, um, we do better when we can eradicate versus suppress predators. So the more predators we can remove, the better the benefits are. And also the longer we can sustain control, the better, better, the, better the benefits they are too. And we've seen that responses vary among different taxonomic groups, among our birds and our invertebrates and our vegetation. And we've seen that of these, our deep endemics seem to be showing the strongest responses overall. 
We've also seen that the variability that we get in the number of pests that remain in these sites can be very informative because it can help us to start to make very clear predictions about where our pest thresholds, pest abundance thresholds are to be able to deliver good outcomes for biodiversity. And I think we, we knew little bits about this for some particular species, but it's amazing to be able to start to show this um, at a national scale and quite clearly. And finally, we've we started to get a better idea of what our ecosystem trajectories look like uh, for birds and for vertebrates um, and for vegetation. Um, and we've started to get a better feel for how full eradication compares to large-scale suppression. Um, so what I, I hope these findings start to highlight is that large-scale suppression um, could be a really important and useful stepping stone towards the ultimate goal of eradication further down the track. As I think Bruce said earlier in the panel, we don't currently have the tool for complete eradication across the whole mainland currently. But what about if we think of large scale control um, as a stepping stone towards that and a means of holding the line on pests while we start to come up with a more concrete strategy for how and where we should hold the line versus remove and defend towards our ultimate goal of full eradication. And finally, I want to finish by coming back to partnering for impact. This work just would not have been possible without the partnerships um, among these sanctuaries and other agencies. Uh, and the, the very meticulous biodiversity monitoring that these sites do, um, I think just deser deserves a huge round of applause uh, and should be a key part of our uh, restoration future. Um, but there are still knowledge gaps that are remaining, so I would definitely call for future um, long-term and very consistent monitoring to be supported, um, but also for us to come up with a strategy for how to really capitalise on that monitoring um, to really set us up well uh, towards our ultimate goal of eradicating pests. And with that, I just want to really acknowledge and, and give a heartfelt thanks to our partners, particularly those in DOC, uh, Craig Gillies, who was instrumental in pulling together all the DOC mainland island data, um, Robbie Price, who helped us with the infrastructure for our, uh, our big database, and all the, the staff and volunteers from our sanctuaries across New Zealand, over 23 sanctuaries contributed um, data for, for this analysis. And last but not least, absolute heartfelt thanks to uh, my amazing colleagues and mentors at Manaki Fenua, so Andrea Byron, John Innes, Roger Peck, Neil Fitzgerald, and Alex James from the University of Canterbury. Thank you very much. Kia ora. Kia Michelle. And you did want a big round of applause as well for all of the sanctuaries, right? For the sanctuaries. Huge, yes, huge round. <laughs> So I've seen on the app that we do have quite a few questions for you already, and just a few minutes to answer them. Uh, so the first one is from Beats. Uh, how do we prioritise the location of eco centuries? Is, is this on? Yep. Uh, that's an excellent question. So I think um, really we want to have as many sanctuaries in as many kind of diverse ecosystems as possible. So we have a lot of um, sanctuaries, particularly around the North Island, but it would be great to see even more on the South Island. We have things like Orokanui um, and a new one, Brook by Madama, um, in terms of fence sanctuaries and a whole number of unfenced sites too. Um, but it would be good to see uh, a bigger spread in different types of habitat for sanctuaries. A lot of our sanctuaries are podocarp broadleaf forest sanctuaries or coastal. Um, we don't have very many beach forest sanctuaries, for example. Um, so it would be nice to, to see more of those pop up. Um, and I think having these different types of sanctuaries um, and, and different tools allows us to really restore more diverse biota uh, and different types of communities, yeah. And our next question, Landcare Research has amassed and analysed a huge amount of data on predator control outcomes. Is this data analysis easy to access or is there open access? That's a good question. So this, this has been a huge partnership and, and data management and data ownership um, is not a, an easy problem to solve. Actually, even just pulling all this data together and finding out who had measured what and where was, was quite a challenge. Um, and because this is a partnership, there's a, a lot of trust. So I think if um, for this data to be open access, it would be a matter of going back and having that 
discussion with the, the sanctuaries and the people who've collected and shared this data for this work. Um, but I, I suspect a lot would be happy for, for this data to be used um, to, to answer different questions, uh, but we would have to have that, that discussion, yeah. And unfortunately, this has to be our last question, because at least they're high quality, even though we have a small <laughs> amount of time. Uh, you state that the more predators we remove, the better the response. Does it matter what combinations or order we remove pests in? For instance, removing just possums and rats versus just possums. Uh, that's a really good question, and I, I don't have the, the simple answer to that, but I think there's a lot of great minds in this room that, that could start to pick apart that problem. I think we, we understand um, some of this. Uh, what's interesting is that when we go to eradication and, and take out a lot of pests, we don't eradicate mice inside sanctuaries, um, so there will be impacts from, from those pests. And maybe that's something that, that if we were eradicating large scale in the mainland, we would have to be contending with as well. Um, so that in terms of possums, rats, um, that's not something we've teased apart yet, but the data is there now so that we can start to, to, start to answer these tricky questions with eight seconds to spare. I did notice as well that you put your email on your last slide, so obviously with all of these questions, could we ask that people can get in touch with you direct? Absolutely, okay? yeah, and in the coffee breaks too. <laughs> and also, what, give us your social media. No, that's all good. Thank you so much. Please put your hands together for Rochelle. And it was great to see a weta up on the screen for the first time uh, this week, I believe. Uh, weta, of course, a really great, important uh, part of New Zealand. And, and I guess there's a workshop that I think is related to that. Uh, the issue, though, is that weta, of course, has a long e and ta, of course, weta. Uh, so there should be macrons over the both of those. And I did actually point that out to them because it's really unfortunate that they don't have macrons and therefore it's the weta workshop not the weta workshop. And the really unfortunate thing about that is weta, without the weta, actually means excrement. So I did say to them, what are you guys making there? Um, and although they can do CGI for huge movies, they can't manage two Macrons. And I did say, you know, and they said, yeah, it's just a bit hard to change the logo. Okay, so it's a shit workshop. Um, now we go on to rapid fire. And of course, we are in our theme of Whakahu, and I would like to introduce our next session speakers uh, and keep to time. And this is the Bioheritage Research Updates from Aisling Rain from University of Canterbury, Professor Jason Talianakis from University of Canterbury, Dr. Brad Case from AUT, and Corinne Batil, University of Canterbury. Tēnā koutou katoa, no mai, haere mai. And a big hand, ho mai te pakita. You're poised to come towards us uh, straight away, Aisling Tanakwe. Tēnā koutou katoa, e te mana whenua, kei te mihi. I have the privilege of working alongside mana whenua, scientists, practitioners in primary industry to co-develop a conservation genomics approach to enhancing resilience in threatened populations. We have focused on five taxonomically diverse species, hihi, kaka, kekewai, wetapunga, <laughs> and kowaro, as proxies for threatened taonga species found both on land and in our streams, lakes, and rivers. To a conservation genomicist, a resilient population is one that can evolve or adapt in response to environmental change. Populations with a lot of genomic diversity are generally better able to adapt. So as conservation genomicists, we seek to enhance resilience through strategies that maximize genomic diversity. For example, in Waitaha Canterbury, kekewai, or freshwater crayfish, are being increasingly driven to small isolated populations. This is putting them at risk of increased geno uh, decreased genomic diversity and increased inbreeding and may be limiting their ability to adapt to future change. In the past, to address this, we would likely recommend moving individuals between populations to increase genomic diversity and reduce inbreeding. And now with the rise of genomic technologies, we can now tell not just whether populations are different, but how they are different. 
Combining these genomic data with non-genomic data can better inform which populations we should be sourcing individuals from. For example, if we identify genetic variants in a Kekewai population that are pre-adapted to predicted environmental change, let's say they increase heat tolerance, we may recommend using those pre-adapted individuals to augment existing populations or establish new ones. It's clear that we need innovative management actions such as these to resolve declines in our most threatened, spe <laughs> threatened species. 76% of our freshwater fish and 26% of our freshwater invertebrates, both in blue, are threatened with or at risk of extinction. These numbers are similar to their terrestrial counterparts, both in green, and yet while most terrestrial vertebrates and a handful of invertebrates enjoy full legal protection under the 1953 Wildlife Act, the only legally fresh protected freshwater fish or invertebrate is the upokororo, or the grayling, last seen in 1923. Instead, current legislation regarding freshwater fauna falls patchily across several acts, including the Conservation, the Fisheries and the National Parks Acts. Rather than considering our indigenous freshwater species as taonga, existing legislation follows that Western paradigm of treating freshwater and its biodiversity as a resource for exploitation. Among the many issues this lack of legal protection poses for our freshwater species, from a conservation genomics perspective, responsive legislation is crucial to translate the flood of emerging knowledge, including genomic data, into evidence-based management. For example, if a combination of genomic data and climate change modeling suggests current habitat will become unsuitable for Kekewai, we may need to establish new populations outside the species' current range. Application fees for conservation translocations are waived for species protected under the Wildlife Act and supported by a strong evidence base. But moving unprotected species such as Kekewai into new habitat requires an onerous and expensive permit process with relatively few resources available to guide decision making. These factors can discourage, end use, uh, discourage action by end users, whether those are conservation practitioners such as DOC, trusts such as Te Kohaka o Tu Haitara, or Runanga such as Hokonui. That said, improving legal protection for our threatened freshwater fauna cannot be as simple as adding them to the Wildlife Act. Here I'd like to mihi to Phil Liver and Jamie Ataria, who both lead projects elsewhere in the Bioheritage Challenge and colleagues for their scholarship in this space. You need only step out of the water and into the forest to see that conservation legislation, such as the Wildlife Act, falls far short of providing mana whenua with full authority, or tinoranga teretanga, over their taonga katoa. We need to move beyond a traditional Western approach that seeks to protect biodiversity by isolating it from the people, for example, by restricting customary harvest of mahinga kai species, such as kereru. Instead, conservation legislation for threatened freshwater species must reflect both Mātauranga Māori and Western science. In line with the bioheritage impact, whakaho, we are calling for legislative reform that is responsive to emergent knowledge and empowers mana whenua as kaitiaki of taonga species, both in our forests and in our rivers. Kia ora. Better Aisling for a really different angle, which I really enjoyed uh, to hear. And also in terms of natural and new habitats for Kekewai, uh, someone here has a video of one they discovered in a drain just up there. Yes, Ara, you can go and have a look. It's very cute, but perhaps quite a dangerous new habitat for them to choose. Now could we hear from Professor Jason Talianakis from University of Canterbury, Tenakwe. So ecosystems are like a glass of wine. The environmental drivers can come along and perturb that ecosystem, move it into a degraded state, and with restoration we presume that we can just undo those drivers and send the ecosystem back to where it was. But sometimes ecosystems can reach a tipping point where even a small amount of some external driver can trigger a number of feedbacks which propel the system into a new highly degraded state. 
and then those same feedbacks prevent you from being able to recover it even if you undo the driver that initially um, sent it off on that trajectory. Just like gravity uh, moves this glass into a, a new, new state that we can't undo by pushing it backwards. And these feedbacks can be um, biophysical, we often think of lake eutrophication as a classic example, or they can be social, like the economic drivers that, um, that, uh, that are associated with land use intensification. So within project 3.1, um, oh no, this is the, sorry, the old version of my talk, so I'm, I might get things wrong. Um, within project 3.1, um, we've been trying to um, review some of the, uh, and understand some of the knowledge associated with these um, tipping points. And in particular, this work from uh, Auckland University and uh, Manaki Whenua has been looking at using paleo data and, and sediment cores to try and, uh, try and understand how our present day ecosystems can actually be the result of historical tipping points. So Rose's work in Lake Rotokare showed that um, diatong communities are actually still today in a state that was caused by fires upon the at the time of arrival of Europeans. And these long term data sets also allow us to, um, to inform um, restoration targets and to understand baselines for biodiversity. And uh, in Quinn's PhD work, he's combining these with models to try and predict uh, upcoming tipping points and look for early warning signals. But once a tipping point has occurred, um, Bev's group um, from Manaki Whenua in collaboration with Doc Fonterra, Northern Regional Council and various landowners has been looking at trying to break um, feedbacks, in particular those associated with invasive species. So they've demonstrated that a biological control of uh, a nasty weed, Tradescantia, can lead, to, lead the forest fragments on private land to undergo a recovery trajectory and um, break the feedbacks associated with invasion and, and preventing recovery. Now, both of these are biophysical examples, but in fact, um, restoration, oh, sorry, but uh, in fact, Western conservation typically excludes the human aspect. And I mentioned earlier that there can be social drivers of tipping points. But Western conservation paradigm frequently limits how humans interact with the environment. We think of humans as the drivers of bad changes and don't think of humans using the environment as necessarily part of the solution. Um, so within the project, we've been trying to explore human linkages with the environment. Uh, and in, in this work uh, between University of Canterbury and Manaki Whenua, we've been, um, we've been combining national scale survey data with models of, of um, human interaction, social relationships, and spatially explicit landscapes to try and understand how human social networks drive landscape change. And we find that the tendency of people to be influenced by others that are like themselves, we, put ourselves into echo chambers, basically, um, creates a barrier to the spread of, of uh, new behaviours across the landscape. And it actually results in less positive environmental action uh, within the landscape than you'd expect at random. But if you can get some kind of a feedback from the environment back to people, so if people are able to see what their neighbours are doing, even if they're not friends with those people, see those positive environmental actions, that can create a new positive feedback um, that, that uh, produces better landscape outcomes. But possibly the, the link between humans and the environment is most pronounced when we think about indigenous people's relationship with the environment. Now, indigenous peoples the world over frequently um, use the environment, extract resources, um, including the harvest of native species, as both a reason for and also a mechanism for learning about, understanding, managing, and responding to the environment. And in this uh, work, uh, which is a partnership with Project 3.2, which Corinne will speak about soon, um, and also with collaborators from Tuhoe Tua Whenua and Rakiura, um, we've been examining a number of the feedbacks, um, social, economic, um, and, and ecological feedbacks that can break the connections of indigenous peoples with their environment. And, um, these can include things like we've just heard about the Wildlife Act, which prevents the harvest of a lot of native species here in Aotearoa. And once these feedbacks get triggered, um, you can have the long-term loss of, uh, of knowledge, um, matauranga, you can get the breakdown of social structures, and all of these feedbacks can have negative environmental outcomes, as well as, of course, uh, causing long-term cultural um, extinction. So, 
sorry, wrong button. Um, so to try and address these things, uh, Lynn and Rose have been partnering with Kati Huirapa. They identified inanga or white bait as a, um, as a priority for them, and they've been looking at how to address biophysical feedbacks, like um, uh, increased spawning of the site availability, as well as social feedbacks associated with declines of the species. So um, they're looking at ways to try and preserve mātauranga and to um, prepare for future possible changes. So to sum up, um, restoring or restoration require, uh, of tipping points requires not just removal of the driver that caused the change, but also addressing the feedbacks that keep the system in a degraded state. And those, that can require uh, the reintroduction of human environment linkages. The visibility of positive environmental actions by landowners is one such mechanism for doing this um, and breaking the feedback of like influencing like. And finally, policies that reduce Māori engagement with the environment um, can generate feedbacks that are both harmful for biodiversity in the long term as well as cultural diversity. Kia ora. Kia ora, Jason. I guess we have to get people to the point where they care as much about these kaupapa as someone spilling their wine, you know? We can't be losing your wine. Uh, no reire, ina inei, ka huri te titiro ki akwe, Dr. Brad Case from AUT. Tēnā koe. Kia ora. Our project has been going for about two years now, uh, and we've been working on understanding how to enhance biodiversity in agroecosystems. If we want to stop the decline or even increase biodiversity in New Zealand, where do we do this and how do we do it? We're showing how agroecosystems can be one of the solutions to this. A key result from our project is that 40% of New Zealand is currently managed under sheep and beef farming, and that these farm ecosystems contain about 17% of New Zealand's remaining native woody vegetation, and that much of this vegetation is in lowland areas that are not well represented in our conservation estate. So we have an opportunity here to enhance biodiversity and to increase ecosystem function across a large area of New Zealand by connecting existing vegetation components and restoring new vegetation in less productive areas of these farms. So there are about over 12,000 sheep and beef farmers in New Zealand. And we've been talking to them recently about what biodiversity is and what it means to them. And it's clear that biodiversity is actually really important to farmers, and we've heard a little bit about that over the past day or so. Um, and the majority have already considered how to incorporate biodiversity in their farm planning, and they're actively doing things like managing for pest animals and weeds. About 50% of the farmers we talked to indicated that they had more than 10% of their land already set aside for things like biodiversity protection. And so, these sheep and beef farmers are largely already on board in a lot of ways with the idea of enhancing biodiversity, and so this is an obvious place for us to focus our efforts. But we also know there's some really significant barriers to improving biodiversity in farm ecosystems, and 40% of the farmers that we talked to said they don't either have the time or the money or even the skills or knowledge to protect biodiversity adequately. And However, uh, some of our ag research collaborators on this project have shown that farmers don't necessarily have to forfeit their profit at the expense of biodiversity management. And by optimi optimizing farm systems, farmers can retire parts of their farm for conservation and still maintain profitability. So we know that there are things we can do on farm to restore uh, biodiversity, such as um, restoration activities, fencing activities, and these improve habitat quality. Uh, they increase habitat and they increase the connectivity of the habitat across landscapes, and this is ultimately good for biodiversity. But what we don't fully really understand yet is the effects of these activities at the farm scale uh, on our native species and processes specifically across multiple spatial scales. And for instance, some of our lit review work showed that we know more about ecology, our, uh, ecology of our pest mammals in agricultural ecosystems than we do about our native birds. And for 10 of the 18 native species that we looked at in New Zealand, there was actually no information about their movement in, in agroecosystems and the home range sizes. 
And so we need a lot more research on natural history and basic ecology for how our species are functioning in this 40% of New Zealand. And current government schemes such as the One Billion Trees Scheme are providing a way to roll out restoration activities across the country at a large scale, but how do we get the most out of this type of funding program for biodiversity gain? We've now just got some co-funding to set up long-term experimental trials to demonstrate the science required to achieve old growth forest restoration as fast as possible and inv investigate the social drivers of why people would gauge, engage in native forest restoration, including using carbon as an incentive. So there's a gap, in, also a gap in biodiversity knowledge amongst landowners, farmers, consultants and the public in general, and we need to develop innovative ways to deliver knowledge about biodiversity and the skills to manage for it to the landowners and to the people who influence the agricultural sectors. And our project is creating resources aimed at stakeholders, students, and the public in order to address this gap. And our project is also working towards developing analysis methods and decision support tools to predict what the consequences of our on-farm biodiversity management activities might be at the landscape scale in terms of ecological processes. And so filling the, the science knowledge gaps about how our flora and our fauna and our ecological processes operate within farm ecosystems is urgently needed, there's no doubt about that. But the key to restoring biodiversity and resilience on farmlands in New Zealand is mostly about reaching people, as we've talked about, to create the right relationships and the right action. And so now much of our effort is directed at multiple ways to achieve this, like the creation of decision support tools based on remote sensing and our extension activities, including trialing restoration ambassadors across New Zealand and putting out online extension resources to reach large groups of people. And ultimately, we hope that through harnessing these opportunities within agroecosystems, we can start to reverse the decline of New Zealand's native biodiversity. Thank you. Kia ora, Brad. And I did see Living Labs, is it, that we can follow online? Yep. Kia ora, uh, And finally, could I please welcome Karen Batale from the University of Canterbury. Tēnā koe, no mai. So my research is about values and priorities of iwi and landowners regarding the management and use of wetlands uh, by Māori uh, in New Zealand. So because this research is about Māori management and use of wetlands, I followed my understanding of Kopapa Māori research. Kopapa Māori research means research by Māori, for Māori and with Māori. But what about non-Māori researchers? For the past two and a half years, I've um, received guidance and support from a NITAHU advisory committee made up of wetland practitioners from different Ruananga. It was important that NITAHU took leadership in this research project, and the committee was created specifically to guide and advise the research. My supervisory team and I have been meeting regularly with Nigel Scott from Te Ruananga NITAHU and the committee every six months to discuss uh, different aspects of the research. What we already know is that New Zealand wetlands are in a critical condition. So how do we save them? Could better engagement between actors help? There are two types of actors we are especially interested in. First, kaitiaki, or Maori practitioners and harvesters, like Craig Pauling pictured here. Craig is harvesting black swan eggs at Te Waihora, Lake Kerismia, near Ototahi Christchurch. One issue that Kaitiaki, like Craig, are finding is um, access to Mahingakai sites like these. There are also landowners, and these are wonderful examples of how or what can be done to integrate wetlands into agricultural landscapes. I conducted 26 semi-structured interviews, including landowners who were either farming or had leased their land for farming. The key value for Kaitiaki was Māori, or life force of the environment, that is a healthy wetland ecosystem. Kaitiaki were worried about the current state of uh, wetlands and had difficulties accessing them because they are located on or accessed through private land. Other values were Kaitiaki Tanga, 
which was linked to Mahanga Kai. For Kai Chiaki, it was important to restore the Maori to a healthy functioning state so that foods could be harvested safely. But harvest had also to be sustainable so that future generations might also benefit. This means that Ka Chiaki had to come first before harvest. In other words, Ka Chiaki prioritized investing before using. But how to invest in the Maori when access is difficult? Key values for farmers were economic use, but also environmental stewardship. They had already made mandatory or voluntary changes to their land use practices in order to protect the environment. Some had created wetlands on their properties. And overall, they were either positive or cautious about allowing kaitiaki onto their land for cultural harvesting. The main issue for farmers is that they needed to generate profits before being able to invest them back into environmental stewardship. In other words, landowners prioritize using before investing. In summary, here we have limited access to wetlands because of private land ownership, but my landowner sample was supportive of allowing access. Agricultural lands are key for uh, restoring wetland biodiversity, and there are some commonalities, but Kaichiaki and landowners and farmers particularly have different priorities. Importantly, in Canterbury, farmers are required to get a consent to farm, and as part of this, they need to protect and enhance Mahinga Kai. So the question is, might opening lock gates enable Kaichiaki and landowners to work together to restore wetlands? Wetlands are Tanga and should be protected and valued as such. If Kaichiaki have greater access to wetlands, they can work together with landowners, community, and scientists to protect, enhance, and restore wetlands. Kaichiaki can inform landowners about Mahinga Kai species, why they're important, where they are on their land, and how to protect them. My Kaichiaki and landowner participants were highly motivated to protect wetlands, but two things are needed. Legislation that truly honors Article 2 of the Treaty of Waitangi. And public funding that effectively supports the protection of Tanga over economic use. Thanks to all those who have supported me so far, including my participants. And huge thanks to the NITO Advisory Committee for all their help. And I'd like to leave you with this wonderful Fakatoki, Naminui Katato. and thank you for sharing this beautiful whakatauki, uh, which is a guiding light for kaitahu, uh, ngaitahu as well, uh, iwi. Nō reira, e karema, uh, it is your turn again to get into the questions, and I see that you are already, so please do tell us who the question is directed to, and feel free to vote on the questions you'd like to be answered, because that will help our prioritising. So to Brad first, ecosystem management says that nature must have value to humans. How is this reconciled with kaitiaki elevation of the status of nature? above humans, and that's from Waitangi. So can Brad have the mic? Yeah. Hello. Okay. Uh, yeah, um, well, I think um, that, uh, yeah, nature, yeah, ecosystem management says that nature must have value to humans, and that's true. And how is this re reconciled with the elevation of the status of nature above humans? Well, I think that it's a relationship um, that it's the relationship that's actually important. And so um, whether whatever way or whatever um, sort of uh, perspective you take on it, it's about how we interact with nature that, that actually matters. And so the reconciliation is actually about um, how we get people out into nature and how we work with the people such as Māori and others to get their perspectives on, on what that means and to make that work for all of us. So I guess that's kind of my answer to that. Kia ora. Uh, Aisling, sorry, I mispronounced your name. Aroha mai. Aisling, uh, so there's a couple of questions for you there. First of all, would legal protections of fish species include white bait species? Uh, that is an excellent question. Uh, we haven't discussed 
exactly what species would be falling under this protection, but as Taonga species, they absolutely would be involved in these conversations and um, we really are in the early days of thinking about this and so just hoping to contribute a little bit more towards that conversation and the species that are involved with us kind of would fall into that. Kapai, and so um, we go on to these other questions for you. So, uh, what could more responsive, culturally appropriate and comprehensive legislation look like? Is this a problem just with fresh water or does wildlife legislation as a whole need to be revamped? Mm. So continuing on from what I just said there, we are um, very much just dipping our toes into the spaces, um, conservation genomicists, um, and there obviously have been many conversations in this space going on for a long time, led by many great minds, some of whom are here in this room today. Um, and what we can see is that from, through our experience and from our perspective, it needs to change and we need to begin having a conversation around how that changes and that needs to be happen with uh, all end users and particularly tangata whenua. And clearly, I think as I alluded to in my talk, current wildlife legislation for fresh water is a problem, but also more widely across all tanga species. It currently isn't responsive to both treaty partners. Okay, Kapai, so I'll give you a second before we have another question for you. But Brad, um, this is a question from Bruce Clarkson. Are you considering moving beyond habitat patch protection to ensure survival of biodiversity and farming landscapes in the longer term? Yeah, thanks, Bruce. That's a good question. Um, yeah, so it's not just about um, uh, protection of patches, obviously, in the landscape. Um, and we need to be thinking about... Um, other ways and other areas to restore um, and enhance uh, biodiversity in these farm ecosystems. And that includes um, you know, improving the connectivity between patches, uh, but also thinking about things um, at a landscape scale uh, as opposed to just kind of a patch by patch basis. So we need to think about what the outcomes are for our species um, at the landscape scale. And uh, I think we don't really know that well at the moment um, in terms of how they move around, how they use resources, what resources are there. Uh, and of course, um, pest management is a, a major uh, component of all this. So that's one of the, the other things we need to be doing in these landscapes. Kapai, kia ora. Uh, so it looks like it's back at you, Ashley. Um, Māori have not agreed to science owning whakapapa data. And therefore, are you looking towards a question that was right up there and very well scripted, so I'd like to see it again. Uh, kapai. Does your genomic uh, research have sovereign data agreements with hapu, noting that at the very least, uh, provenance, permission, and purpose? And that's from Waitangi. Uh, kia ora, Waitangi, and thank you for a really important and awesome question. Um, this is a really important conversation that... Uh, we are all having at the moment, uh, particularly led by groups such as Genomics Aotearoa, um, and also a discussion that my supervisor, Tammy, talked about yesterday, which is part of a paper being led by my colleague, Levi Collier Robinson. Um, so kia ora to you guys. Um, but we are, as part of our research, we have been co-developing or all parts of it through an iterative of decision-making timeline that we uh, co-developed with our local mono whenua, Naituahiriri. And as part of that timeline, we have conversations around uh, data storage um, collection and security. And those include uh, data security agreements um, to ensure that the uh, all data is um, protected and under uh, data security agreements. Um, and we, at any time um, throughout the process, we always go back to our mana whenua and make sure that if anything changes or anything further needs to happen, that they have final authority over those decisions around who owns the data um, and who it belongs to. But this is absolutely a moving feast, so we 
Yes, but we could probably have a panel just on that kaupapa, I believe. Uh, Brad, food systems are one of the main causes of biodiversity issues. Will approaches to improving biodiversity on farms address this, or do we need transformative change to current food systems? Um, I think changes to our food systems, the way we farm, are coming. Um, I suspect that it's going to come pretty quickly. Um, as uh, the pressures on our environment increases and as attitudes around farming uh, shift uh, over the next decade or two. So I think, um, I think biodiversity is a component within there. I don't think biodiversity is going to shift the way we do things, but I think by talking about biodiversity with the people who make our food, um, it opens up a new dialogue um, with, these, with, with farmers and with landowners uh, about other aspects that are important to all of us. And so I think um, there's going to be an ongoing discussion around this for sure. Kia ora. Uh, and Jason, you can probably see on the Magic 8 Ball, uh, post tipping point, should we focus more on restoring ecosystem services and species interaction rather than just to focus on species? That's from Patrick Harvey. Yes and no. Uh, Kia ora Patrick for that question. Um, so yes and no is the answer. I, I think it is important. We do need to restore more than just particularly numbers of species um, and even identities of species. Um, we've recently, one of my students actually has recently done a, a meta-analysis um, on the success of restoration projects and actually found that the functional diversity you get out of restoration is typically proportionate to what you'd expect at random for the species diversity. So in some ways, species diversity does tell you a lot, even though we often criticise it. And given that most people don't even uh, monitor that after restoration, I think that would be a really good start. Um, but uh, and the, a risk with restoring ecosystem services is that is a different priority, and it's important to recognise that that is a, a different objective, um, whether you're restoring biodiversity f to have the, the species that were there, for example, versus restoring potentially even non-native species which might contribute to ecosystem services and I, I think that's a not really a scientific answer it's a, um, a cultural human based uh, answer which of those would prioritize um, but definitely restoring interactions and, and functioning ecosystems has to be part of the um, point of restoration. Kia ora. Kia ora. And while we're speaking about native species, kia ora Corinne. Thank you for your kōrero. I was interested in the answer to the question you posed about how a non-Māori researcher works in a kaupapa Māori framework. Kapai, there is a question in there. Kia ora. Thank you for your yeah. question. Yes, it starts with learning the language, te reo Māori, starting to learn the language and practising as much as, as I can. And also it starts from a place of um, humility and not being scared to take feedback um, which I always class as feedback is always constructive as, as far as I'm concerned and not being scared to um, cause a, make a faux pas and I would tell uh, the NITAHU advisory committee please tell me if I'm making a huge mistake or if I'm being silly. Um, so yeah, just being aware, to, uh, aware of that. Um, yeah, I, so. I should say that your reo is very good and I'm mihi, in particular to uh, New Zealanders who didn't grow up here. Uh, the people who got up on stage have been really impressive. Um, no reira, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, Jason, is increased land fragmentation a challenge for ecological tipping points? If so, what can be done to overcome this coordination failure? Sure, it's a problem for everything in biodiversity. Um, so we know that there are, um, there are thresholds of, of landscape cover that can affect biodiversity, and once you dip below those thresholds, you get a rapid decline in biodiversity. The, I, I emphasised before the, the um, need to focus on feedbacks, and there are all kinds of feedbacks there, like LE effects, um, dis ability to disperse, uh, metapopulation effects, and so on. So there's a lot of reasons why fragmentation can take you beyond a point of no return that we don't want to go down. Um, so what can be done to overcome this coordination failure? It is extremely difficult because 
much of our biodiversity, although we do have to focus on rewards, uh, on reserves, sorry, much of our biodiversity is on private land, on small fragments of habitat. And those are governed by individual landowner decisions. So it really, uh, the coordination really becomes a question of collective action. And there's a huge social literature on collective action, what drives it, what barriers there are to it. And um, I'm not sure we know the answer yet, but that is where the answer will have to lie, is in coordinating and motivating individual landowners to work together, because you can't legislate that you must you know, preserve a fragment if it's next to another person's property who has to have another, happens to have another fragment so as to maximise connectivity. You know, those things can't be done by legislation, at least not easily. He pai hoki tēnā hei whakautu, whakamutunga, and I guess that's a great way to leave this session uh, because it really has been about the theme of collaboration and what it takes to really whakohu, to really restore. Nō reira, hō mai te pakipaki te, ki tēnā i rōpū, tēnā pai kōrero. I can see that morning tea is sitting in our puku right now. I smashed three and I'm pretty proud of that, those little uh, pasties there. So let's get ourselves standing up at two. Uh, Oringa kiterangi, kitefenua, kitemoana, kinga maunga. Okay, we're going to speed it up now. Fenua. <laughs> I know it's just everywhere. I feel like the land is all around me. Fenua, fenua, rangi, maunga, <laughs> maunga, moana, fenua, rangi, moana, rangi. Whenua, maunga, whenua, koe, yeah. Hō mai te paki paki. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa, I couldn't miss the opportunity when I see our beautiful native birds there, and I guess I have a bit of a bias towards them, but I wanted to share uh, another kind of phrase that I have uh, quite some certainty that you will enjoy. Hō miro miro, kōrero mai hō miro miro is a hard word to say. It is the North Island tomtit. And so when we say karu as an eye, ho miro miro, karu ho miro miro is someone who has an eye for detail. Because just like the ho miro miro, tiny little bird, it can sit at the top of the tree and yet can still see its kai down on the whenua. So they are karu ho miro miro. But in the south, we actually call them ngiru ngiru. So we go from one hard word to another, but you can choose either of them, and it's actually the term we now use for sub-editors. Nō reira, tēnā koutou ngā karu hō miro miro. E nai nei ka huri tātou, uh, ki tau a wahine toa anō, uh, Melanie Mark Shadbolt. If you don't know who she is, where have you been the last couple of days? Uh, she is a lot of things, one of them being the Ministry for the Environment's Kai Hautu Chief Māori Advisor, and of course Chief Executive of Te Tira Whakamātaki. So please welcome her back to the stage for the next panel. Uh, kia ora koutou. I'm just uh, waiting for my boy band to get seated. <laughs> They're going to break out into synchronised dance soon. They've been practising. <laughs> uh, kia ora koutou. Uh, uh, thank you for the introduction. And uh, welcome to, and we're carrying on of this Whakaho Restore session on Aotearoa's unique approach to ecosystem restoration. Our topic in particular is New Zealand's biodiversity trajectory, shifting the dial from extraction to restoration. Very lucky to be uh, joined by a panel of very learned men, and, uh, and we will introduce them and ask them a question, and then open the floor to other questions. So they will get a, a wee chance to have a put it all uh, first. So the planet we are occupying is dying, and we heard we are facing new, emerging, and much larger threats than ever before. The unsustainable patterns of economic activity we have been following have led to a build-up of systemic risk across sectors and major risks to human life and prosperity. Things like air pollution, biological hazards, and overdependence on single crops are putting much pressure on our environment, and in particular our biodiversity. We are now threatened with undermining the entire natural infrastructure on which, in which our modern world, including our economic models, depend on. So how do we shift the dial from a model of extraction to one of restoration? To discuss this with me today is my boy band. And starting first with Peter Brunt. 
Peter is the Director of Policy for Te Papa Atawha, the Department of Conservation. In that role, he was responsible for facilitating the development of the new biodiversity strategy for Aotearoa New Zealand. The last one wasn't, was developed back in 2000, so a wee while ago. Peter has a long background in environmental and energy policy in New Zealand and in Europe. He arrived at DOC in 2017, and prior to that he had led freshwater RMA climate change for the Ministry for the Environment. Before even arriving in Aotearoa, New Zealand in 2019, Peter worked for the European Parliament in the UK Energy and Environmental Ministries on lots of various issues from transportation to nuclear power, energy, those kinds of things. Uh, so I'm mindful that DOC, like we just said, is currently working on the new biodiversity strategy. Given work on biodiversity is a combination of both the bottom-up and a top-down approach, how do we ensure bottom-up and top-down work better together so that we reach all parts of our community? Okay, kia ora um, everybody. So um, that's, that is one of the key questions that the new biodiversity strategy, which little plug will be coming out for consultation July, August, um, will I think pose. So um, we're quite conscious that biodiversity is quite a complex system. It's got loads and loads of actors in it. And I think as came up in the panel just a moment ago, um, there's a national framework part of it. So we kind of tend to think of it in terms of national role being frameworks and facilitation. Um, but that national framework can only take you so far. So, um, you know, you can't, intrinsic biodiversity is a local set of issues um, and have to be responded to, particularly when you get into restoration in kind of local contextual kind of ways. So, so I think kind of one of our kind of key questions of biodiversity strategy is when you're thinking about that sort of facilitation and that sort of frameworks context, how, how deep and how far should government go? So government is developing a, an NPS national policy statement on, on biodiversity. Um, so to what, you know, to how prescriptive should that be versus how um, so, you know, facilitative should that be? Of, of kind of local communities, community groups, and um, how does government um, play in the role of treaty, the treaty partner in, in helping to manage biodiversity on, on the ground, all of those sorts of things. So it's not something I've got a pithy answer to, but it's a kind of like a, a kind of balancing act, and how in that facilitation and that kind of framework role can we, can we as central government kind of, you know, particularly addressing things like economic frameworks, start to kind of build through this new strategy, kind of, you know, a, a bit of a progress going forward. Well, we'll probably come back to some of that, I think. Um, but I'm going to introduce Dave on the end of the lineup at the moment. Dave helps Iwi and Hapu develop innovative and future-focused policies, policy and legislation, so that they can better influence decision making to support mana whenua and mana moana. Environmental restoration uh, as a means to achieve sustainable management of our natural resources and taonga is a key priority for him. You were the environmental manager, is that correct, for Ngāti Rangi before joining Perception Planning uh, last year. And you have over 12 years' experience, I'm sure it's over that, customary fisheries management, environmental-focused relationship management, local, regional, national policy plans, uh, and regulatory engagement. You're passionate about biosecurity and have been very active in the Cody dieback space. Uh, and cultural landscape design capability and capacity building. So given that Peter has just been talking about engaging communities, the bottom-up approach, and what role does Te Ao Māori have in shifting the dial and connecting people more firmly to nature? Uh, kia ora. Kia ora, Mel. Māori ora, tato. Uh, just quickly, I want to mihi to our kaumatua for uh, our karakia this morning and for carrying the, and asking for blessings from our atua and carrying the kaupapa for all of us here today and our behaviour. So... Kia ora koutou, uh, e rangatira mā. Uh, just in regards to what role does uh, Te Ao Māori have, um, it's a holistic approach. Um, so it's, it's uh, difficult to just hone in on one single species or issue to one single species. So um, it's really about um, um, having a good overview uh, on a balanced approach. So holistic and balanced um, and um, it's sort of it's a primary role in regards to um, Māori and Te Ao Māori in this in this kaupapa, uh, in all kaupapa actually, and so it's just around um, expressing um, the urgency of acknowledging uh, and resourcing mana whenua uh, from flax roots um, up uh, in this in this type of kaupapa. Kia ora. Uh, Next to Dave is David, 
not to be confused with Dave. David is a professor at the University of Canterbury and teaches and researches uh, ecology and conservation biology. His research interests centre on ways to obtain win-win outcomes for native biodiversity, conservation and farming in sheep and beef farming systems, which account for 40% of New Zealand's land area. As part of this, he has a strong interest in restoration ecology and how we use this as a tool to enhance and expand native biodiversity at landscape scales in the systems. So, David, <laughs> some would suggest that our economic models have proved to be unsustainable and have led to the plundering of the planet. Is it possible to continue on this trajectory or should we be considering new economic paradigms? Kia ora, Mel. Thank you for that question yeah, and for the introduction. I think it's a really important question and I noticed in the discussion just at the end of the, um, the last lot of speakers that that was one of the last questions that came up and I think Brad you, you, you answered it. Um, I think when I look at biodiversity and farmland, I mean I see farmland being fundamentally critical for New Zealand, you know 50% plus of New Zealand's pastoral farming. Um, the current intensive models aren't working, um, we, we all know the stats around that, I think we've got to look at trying to change the models of farming. We've got to change them both because of the impacts on the environment but also to make um, the ability for us to be able to sell our products, get an income into New Zealand that can then support the biodiversity work we need to have done here. And I think we need to shift away from our commodity driven focus, um, milk solids, you know, legs of lamb, logs um, going across our wharfs to one that is really adding value to what we're doing in New Zealand. If we can add value, get a higher return for our products overseas, we need to have fewer animals in New Zealand, we'll get more income, there's more money for biodiversity. So absolutely, I think win-win outcomes are going to be the result of that. Yes, yeah, so those win-win solutions are a reality, not a pipe dream? I think they are, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Sean Neely, thank you. Sean Neely grew up on a dairy farm in the northern region of Aotearoa, New Zealand, and has spent most of his life working his working life involved with farming in the South Island. Sean is of Ngaitahu descent. Uh, you took on your first farm manager's role in 2003 and went on to become a 50-50 share milker before moving into roles in corporate agribusiness. Prior to his current role as the Aquila Sustainable Farming uh, General Manager, is that right? Uh, you were the CEO of Fortuna Group, which was a large Southland-based corporate dairy farming business focused on high environmental and financial stewardship of land assets. Aquila are organic farms. They represent the largest conversion of dairy farming to organic certification in New Zealand, sorry. Um, full certification for 5,500 cows. Wow. Sean has been working with the AFS Organic Group since January 2017 and has built a solid reputation for achieving and mainstreaming organic certification at scale while developing good commercial outcomes. So my question for you is, a prominent, will not be named, environmental NGO has publicly stated that dairy and fishing industries were to blame for all of our environmental woes. As a dairy farmer, are those statements true, fair and or helpful? <laughs> so helpful is quite easy to answer so when you've got lobby groups shooting across the bow of other lobby groups it doesn't really encourage a good discussion at all so the answer is that the helpful question and there's a piece that's been fairly consistent through the discussions over the last day and a half around trying to see things from a different point of view and, and involving indigenous points of view with western points of view but also the idea of probably spreads across to scientific understanding of what's going on, uh, commercial reality on businesses that are trying to operate in different spaces, um, lobby groups who are really focused on, on different environmental aspects and landholders, if you like, that are operating in ways that might not be up to spec or up to a standard that those lobby groups would like to see. So it's not helpful at all. Um, Needs to the, the conversation really needs to move from pointing out all the issues all the time to trying to offer some solutions, trying to encourage uh, good behaviours and champion, cha making champion of people who are already acting well in the space. There are, there are a lot of farmers already who are doing some very good stuff. It, it's always been that way. A lot of farm owners are very proud, very environmentally focused, uh, but we don't hear a lot about them. We just, we just hear about you know, all of the negative consequences all the time. Yeah. So then a question for all four of you is, should we focus, I mean, there's so much focus uh, on the negative, what successes or positive stories are there in terms of restoration? I'll 
Yep, of course. Um, I think um, it's, it's an interesting, you know, working with the farming community, and we, we do much of our research on, on farmland with farmers, and, and my feeling is that most farmers are, are really happy to get on, do what they do, do the restoration work they do, but they don't necessarily want to stand up and wave a flag and say, hey, I've done all this great work, they, they just get on and do it. And I think, um, you know, it's obviously not, it's often not very visible, um, but it's going on out there, and there's a lot of good stuff happening out there. Sean? So, um, I mean, if I were going to cite um, something, then I mean, aside from the kind of individual species programs and trajectories and, and various other things, it's the sheer number of particularly landscape scale sort of you know, kind of projects and programs that are now blossoming out there. When I think about Taranaki Maunga, um, I think about um, Pukaha to Palliser, when I think about sort of the top of the south, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a real groundswell, some of it driven by Predator Free 2050, some of it driven by the connection between that and a whole series of other restoration drivers, which is starting to bring together biodiversity, fresh water, climate change, land, sea, um, and, and kind of air in a way that perhaps we haven't seen before. That, to me, is a, is a good projection of the future of, of this stuff. Uh, th there's a good toy in around uh, good activities and value-add discussions, mm -hmm. as David brought up. So there are opportunities for marketing a product better than what New Zealand typically does. Um, unfortunately, we, we've, we've been focused on just trying to create volume of product and move it mm -hmm. as quick as we can. And uh, all the infrastructure around moving that, that product to markets is really commodity-driven, and, and it's impacted by seasonality as well. So our marketing teams have to deal with volume all at once try and get it out, get it sold. Um, and we're not actually skilled at, at value add. Yeah. But there are small players who do it well and have done for a long time. Uh, organics has is, is been an opportunity for our business, at least, to, to kind of step into that market. Our, our product now is, is considered niche. It, it earns a premium. It's no longer value added. And it's a very viable model for operating a farm, lower intensity, and, and, and doing some good work there. Yeah. Um, I want to pick up on one of the questions on here, the bottom one. To, it's aimed at you, Peter, um, but I'm sure there's other um, voices for this one. What opportunities are there for economic tools and incentives to help shift the dial? Thank you, Anonymous. Um, lots, um, I think, potentially. Um, so again, again, plug, one of the key questions, I think, for our biodiversity strategy will be around the use of those economic tools. So, and I think those economic tools both sit within, um, you know, kind of what scope there is through with the tax system, for example, targeted rates. Um, I think in economic incentives, you know, to the degree to which you can build on some of the kind of, you know, through the various ways in which we support the industry, some of the sort of niche marketing that's been described um, kind of next to me. And I think there's also so the, some of the economic in, instruments that are out there at the moment in terms of kind of, you know, natural resources are the ways in which we can explore um, the utilisation of, you know, synergies between carbon farming, for example, and the biodiversity outcomes we can kind of drive. So I think there's lots of opportunity for us to kind of explore um, those, those economic instruments yeah. over the next six to, tw six to 18 months. Yeah. David, you want to add? I think um, I'll add a comment on that. I mean, I agree. I think there's, there's a lot of room for economic instruments and whether it is, and I see there's a question there about carbon, so I'll cover that at the same time. I mean, I think, you know, carbon is, is one of those economic incentives that's out there, and there are many others. But some of the economic incentives, I think, need to be direct, and so carbon's an obvious direct direct incentive, but others can be indirect. So just simply having value-added products that we're getting a better price for internationally is also a really good incentive to change the way you farm. And, mm -hmm. and using biodiversity as, as part of the marketing of the farm product. And you've got to look at what, say, um, Merino Company did with fine walls. Um, and there are other models like it in New Zealand where, where that biodiversity becomes part of the story and it can get a, a much higher value for the farmer. So it creates a greater incentive for, for farmers. Yeah. I think we need both those direct, those direct direct incentives as well as those more indirect incentives. But I think just to add another comment on carbon, I mean, I think one of the biggest challenges with carbon is that, you know, it's, it's great that, that the carbon price is going up again and, and, and hopefully it'll keep going up, but there is that 1990 cutoff, and there's an awful lot of regenerating vegetation across sheep and beef farms and all farms in New Zealand that pre doesn't meet the definitions of, of, of the 1990 cutoff, yet that's putting carbon away all the time. And we need to try and somehow build that into the incentive systems as well, so farmers can get um, a credit out of that carbon that's being sequestered, because it's really important. There's lots of it happening out there. Yeah, thank you. Um, the question I had was around the regulator's role in these new economic paradigms, and I think it kind of relates to, well, we can tie in some of this uh, This question that's targeted at you again, Peter, how biodiversity is taken into account in the 2019 wellbeing budget. So what is the role of 
uh, government regulators and not only the wellbeing budget and biodiversity, but in potential economic models. So um, on the, I'll deal with the wellbeing budget because that's kind of nice and simple. So obviously I can't yet tell you what the how biodiversity is taking into account of the wellbeing budget because that obviously gets yeah, revealed when damn it, um, <laughs> when Minister of Finance stands up and and kind of talks his talk. So um, so what I I will I'll talk about wellbeing more generally, and I think wellbeing is a is a kind of great hook and a great opportunity um, for for biodiversity more generally and for connections to be built more more generally. So you kind of just have to look at the kind of the tourism strategy that's just been launched by a Minister of Conservation and Minister of Tourism together um, to see, you know, kind of the way in which this government is sort of stitching together economic, social, cultural and environmental in, in, kind of, in kind of new and different ways. So I think when you think about biodiversity and the kind of centre to which it might have for a marking a, pro marking a product or a, or a destination um, or for recreation and health, there is a, there's a beautiful opportunity with wellbeing to start making connections and, and kind of you know, across that economic space more broadly in a way that we haven't before. Yeah. Now, in terms of kind of economic regulation, um, that's that's not kind of my, per my personal area of expertise, so um, that's a, that's a difficult one for me to answer. But I think if you think about that well-being budget, you think about the different ways of measuring economic success, that's a good start for then tracking on to the sorts of things you might want to draw through financial markets, through the way in which you market New Zealand products and and develop economic strategy. Yeah. I think Treasury here today would be a of good. That'll be nice. Um, Sean, do you want to comment on what industry would like to see in wellbeing budgets and see potential regulators, it's not only just DOC, it's the MFEs and you know MPIs and, and Treasury, um, thinking about in terms of making it easier for industry to restore? Uh, right. So the wellbeing discussion is quite interesting for us because the rural sector really does struggle with, with all sorts of issues around, around mental health um, it's you know it's a stressful environment, so there's a lot of there's probably a lack of of understanding and communication at the farm level at the ground level for the whole sector, um, and I would like to see uh, government agencies especially, but but people in general, putting more effort into into doing that and having better communication, and taking people on the journey because um, you know all the negativities it, it weighs pretty heavily on quite a few people. Yeah. Yep. That's a good, good point. There. Yeah. I mean, I think um, you know one of the one of the really big challenges I think for getting good biodiversity outcome across farming parts of New Zealand is that we've got to shift from the current sort of blame sort of um, thing that's going on and the, what you quoted before, Mel, you know about farmers being to blame for everything. And we've got to start developing trust. We've got to start developing respect. We've got to start, you know, actually working together and accepting that these are New Zealand challenges and different people and different groups bring different skills. In. And I think at the moment there's far too much. You know, suspicion and lack of trust, and we've got to really break that down. And we've got to actually trust that farmers, if incentivised properly, will be able to manage biodiversity. And farmers, at the same time, have to trust that there are lots of stakeholders who are interested in how they manage their land and can help them manage their land. And we've got to break down those sorts of barriers and build that trust and respect. And I think that's really important. And and a lot of that's not about regulation. It's mm. about um, other ways of doing it, you know, collaborative ways of doing it. So it's a good question. To, a good question to follow on that we had uh, discussed earlier is how do we empower community action without trying to control, coordinate, or stifle the community? For any of you, how do we empower communities without stifling them, including I'll, our farming I'll, community? I'll, I'll kick off then. I mean, my my view is we've got to give a lot more support from the bottom up. Yeah. You know, there, there's lots of. Um, there's lots of groups out there, whether it's individual landowners, land care groups, rural communities, iwi, based on marae, whether it's urban populations with an interest. We've got to give them support, not just technical support, but financial support. And we've got to put in place decent incentives that, that, that allow them to be able to do that, to be able to do that work. And I think that's really important. I mean, it's great to talk to people and tell them how to do it. We've actually got to give them, the landowners and, and the others, actually the skills, so they've got ownership of those things. And I think one of the biggest threats for biodiversity is, is, is not giving landowners ownership of that biodiversity and, and ownership of the management. Yeah. And, and some support to, for, mm. with technical expertise. So there's actually a whole, there's groups all across the country around different water catchments that need special focus, and landowners themselves are, are kind of trying to lead the charge, and, and you know, some of them come from a different ideology, and they just need some support to help understand what they're dealing with a lot better. Yeah. I was going to ask, hold on one okay. Dave, I was going to ask whether that resonates with you in terms of what we see on the ground for mana whenua, and what does ownership mean in terms of owning our biodiversity and um, access to technical expertise? Yeah, kia ora. 
And uh, just to carry on from David's uh, corridor around uh, being able to um, help communities in mana whenua, whānau, hapu, marae, uh, build the skills and, and have that been resourced and just goes back to my point of um, shifting the paradigm from top to bottom to uh, flax roots up. Um, I think it resonates through the corridor that we've just been having and just empowering and enabling uh, that to happen from the flax roots up. So just reiterating my, my previous sort of corridor. David. Um, yeah, I'll, <laughs> I, I think, again, with the farming community, you know, it's interesting. You look at who advises farmers. Um, fa farmers are busy business people. You know, they're not ecologists, so they get advice from different places. They're suspicious of councils. You know, they're suspicious <laughs> of government agencies. Most of their advice comes from, you know, banking reps, from fertilizer reps, from, from farm consultants, from um, stock and station agents. None of those people have got ecology degrees. None of those people know much about ecology. Mm. There's, there's some real gaps in, in getting information out there um, to the people that then advise the farmers. And, and I think that, that to me is one of another really big challenge. We've got to break down and get that information out there in a way that, that those, those, those advisors can then advise farmers and the farmers themselves can get the information too about what, what to do. Actually, that, that's an important consideration to have if you want to think about where to target advice and, and new knowledge and a, a lot of the expertise that farmers rely on for things like nutrients comes from the people that sell them nutrients. Yes. So this is, <laughs> that would be a good starting point. I think another um, key area for the farming industry as well is, is there's some leading sort of um, farmers across the country that are shifting mm. yeah. into new spaces and, and diversifying into other areas which is, um, you know, promising. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to pick one of the questions. I might need to get the technicians to pull it up. I think it's down the bottom. What opportunities do you see for extraction and restoration to occur together? Wood. Well, it's the bottom, if you could grab that one. There we go. Would, for example, selective harvest native timber plantations make a difference for biodiversity? Go, David. <laughs> um, I, I think in the right place the answer is yes. And, and the classic example in New Zealand is totara. I mean, totara grows like a weed in the north, um, less so down in my part of the country. And I think totara is regenerating on farmland through Northland, through parts of East Cape and, and some of those higher rainfall, warmer areas in New Zealand. Totara grows really, really well. Um, and... and you know, it can be managed for timber under, under a um, sustainable management plan or sustainable management permit through MPI. has to be fenced off. It's a specific requirement. Livestock have to be excluded, so the biodiversity is going to benefit. I think there's real opportunities for win-win outcomes, particularly of a tree like Totoro, which is, at the end of the day, probably the most important yeah. New Zealand native tree in terms of its use and its cultural importance and everything else. Mm. And just to, uh, to add a layer of caution over that question <laughs> and, and Dave's, uh, David's approach there... Uh, I, I just like to go back to Te Ao Māori holistic approach, mm. and if we start extracting single species out of mm. the ngāhere, or whatever a resource might be, mm. whether it's gravel or, or whatever, we need to just maintain, you know, mm. is that sustainable, mm. um, is it balanced, and does it maintain the health of our ngāhere, which is a big issue at the moment. Mm. And I'd also add um, reducing species, you know, extracting species is the opposite of increasing biodiversity, in my view. Yeah. So it's, it's more monoculture focus. Mm. Cool. I want to grab this one that says, for all the panel, Jack made the comment yesterday that farmers are doing better in terrestrial biodiversity protection. Then, what well, you can see then, moose, fugitive impacts around freshwater. Do you agree with this? Should we start? Move along. Anyone want to go? I, I actually don't know the answer to that question, <laughs> and I'm, I'm, quite, I'm quite interested in the gentleman to my left's um, view. So, so certainly I would say the narrative around freshwater is certainly pointier than the narrative around terrestrial biodiversity. So I think of lots of examples, yeah. but that may just be the perspective I come from. I think there are lots of examples of really strong terrestrial-based partnerships which, which flow my way, um, whereas the freshwater debate does seem to be particularly pointy. But very interesting, in your view. Bing. Mr. Farmer. <laughs> Amble. So the, the, the stuff around biodiversity with the QE2 Trust, and, and it, see, there's a whole lot of things that, that farmers are engaged in, but it's not all farmers. Um, and there are enough of us who are, who are still cost-focused producers who probably need a wake-up call and need to do more. Um, are we doing better than, than we are around freshwater? In our catchment, at least, I think no. I think the discussion around freshwater is, is really, really relevant. 
Uh, there's a looming risk to businesses that aren't trying to improve their operation around um, having restrictions put in place that really undermine how they operate. So, uh, and I think that's true across most of the country that um, farmers are seriously considering what they're doing, what impact it's having around fresh water. Um, what they don't have is the solutions, mm. and so that's what they're looking for. What, and, and you know, solutions that allow them to stay in business. Because at the moment, the solutions that look like they could work for fresh water um, mean less productivity. Um, and without a value-add opportunity, which is kind of the space I operate in, trying to encourage people to think about organics and other value-add opportunities, without, without that being front of mind, they're at a loss as to how to maintain the viability of their business as, as the change happens. Yeah. Dave, Just, you a, um, Just a real example, I guess, and with one of the uh, largest sort of Māori um, farming organisations in Central Plateau, um, the iwi there have teamed up and uh, hold them to account in regards to their farming practices, especially in fresh water. And so um, that's a really good example of how mana whenua, hapu iwi are engaging with a, with a corporate sort of farming, um, you know, uh, key stakeholder or key land manager of the area. And so there's been opportunities for the environmental team from the iwi to actually um, monitor uh, key waterways. Uh, so, so yeah, you know, there are some that's happening uh, step by step. Yeah. And um, kia ora for that. And to acknowledge that we do have Miraka and Tuaropaki in, mm. um, in the whare today. So if anyone wants to talk about Māori dairy farming, then there's two people to go track down. Um, let's start at the top, Peter, and take a wee shift of focus to Maureen, because it is often the forgotten cousin. I know that it's outside our remit is a challenge, but it, we certainly have some issues in the marine space. How do we shift the dial for marine restoration? So it's, it's definitely within the, um, the, the circle for the biodiversity strategy. Um, so obviously marine environment, nice and easy and non-complex and, and no, competing, no competing sort of interests there. So, um, so, so for me, uh, so with that complexity in mind, for me, the sort of starting point is, um, so, I, so I personally, so this is not speaking on behalf of government or ministers, um, I'm really taken by the approach in the Haraki Gulf around sea change, so this concept of sort of spatial planning. So um, this kind of idea that, that you know, similar to the sort of landscape scale approach we've been talking about for a, um, for a kind of, you know, for an, an area of terrestrial land across freshwater um, and, and land, that you kind of take an approach focused on kind of an area of, um, of, of, of kind of the marine environment and you attempt to work out your kind of uses and your kind of protections and kind of what's more or less important in a kind of joined up kind of way. So, so for me, that, that sort of a process like that driven through some kind of, um, some kind of mechanism is, is the kind of key to kind of future engaging um, and delivering on kind of marine protection. Um, there's lots and lots of steps and lots and lots of thoughts to be kind of you know, gone through there. How does, how does our existing regulatory and legislative regime work in that space? How does you know, fisheries and oil and gas and marine protection and marine mammal sanctuary legislation and all the other 10 trillion different ways of kind of managing the marine environment fit together in that context? So, so just some initial thoughts. <laughs> Good. And are we coordinating those conversations across the various ministries that are...? We are. Oh, very good. <laughs> Dang. Uh, kia ora. Uh, I guess it's my responsibility to talk to this as uh, being a uh, coastal uh, uh, hapu. Um, and uh, really, I guess um, it's uh, te ao tūroa, ki uta ki tai. Um, and that's really around the whole environment from the mountains to the sea. And so I guess um, it's all the um, land management or land uses that impact on the awa or rivers and then spill out big, huge plumes into our moana. So we need to get a lot sorted and, uh, on our mountains, mm. on the whenua uh, and the awa, uh, and then that will automatically make a difference for our moana. Yeah. Let's take the top one. How can biodiversity restoration be better linked to climate change adaptation and mitigation? Isn't there a big opportunity to work on these two mega issues together? David, do you want to have a go? Yep, no, I'm happy to answer that. I mean, I think um, you know, everyone's familiar with One Billion Trees. It's been had a lot of discussion the last year or so. And I mean, clearly it's an important, it's an important tool for, um, for working with climate change. So restoration, bringing more, more forest in, is going to sequester more carbon. But at the end of the day, trees are never going to be the answer. The answer is 
those cars we drive and all the other things we do and, 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 and I guess the number of cattle we have on our farms as well. And I think you know, trees are part of the answer uh, and they're really important. It's a great chance to get an awful lot more native habitat out there, but um, it um, shouldn't be done in isolation from all the other stuff. Yeah. Anyone else mm. want to comment on that one? Because I think it leads nicely into the next one otherwise. Yeah, so the next one is specific targets, like you just said about, you know, the billion trees is a great idea. Uh, you know, Predator-free tw Predator 2050 created this movement, it's created an incentive and, and momentum. Um, you know, climate change is sexy, we can sell climate change, but how do, do we need something similar for ecological restoration? Do we need something similar to climate change for biodiversity? Go, Vida. Um So we, we certainly like one, so um, we think for, to make the, so there's a one down below, there's a little question down below around crazy ambitious um, yeah. for the biodiversity strategy, so we'd like the biodiversity strategy to be crazy ambitious, um, so one thing that we have observed is exactly this, that if you have a kind of clear, you know, key and inspiring kind of longer term goal you want to end up with, then that tends to kind of focus minds, you know, it's not tomorrow, but you can kind of build your, your steps towards it. It's it fair to say in our initial conversations today, trying to get someone to come up with a crazy ambitious long term goal for rest restoration is a little bit like, I don't know, herding cats, so we'd be very interested in suggestions for what a 2050 goal for restoration might look like. So that's a challenge to everyone here though, challenge to everyone here to come up with a crazy ambitious uh, goal for yeah, Peter. I, I think I have a bigger challenge. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, so the, the goal, would having a goal defined would be great, but to get the action uh, for the landowners, it, it's really what are, what are they going to monitor how are they going to know how they're tracking? Um, at this stage, uh, farmers in general are typically quite data rich, but it's all around productivity and, and cost structures. But if you give them a target, they can usually do pretty well at trying to hit it. So if you had some targets on biodiversity on something that was able to be monitored in an in a, um, ecosystem and encourage farmers to try and hit, hit those targets, I think we'd see some really good action. But we don't know what those, farmers don't know what those targets would be. A challenge back to you, Peter, some targets. Oh, God. Um, I think um, the answer to the question about targets, I mean, it's happening all around New Zealand already. I mean, think about all the landscape level conservation projects that are out there. Um, Banks Peninsula Conservation Trust, the uh, Cape to City, yeah. Reconnecting Northland, all of these projects around the country have got their own targets that are being developed for their own regions. And I think, we're actually, again, it's that bottom up stuff. It's already happening, and, and I think um, there's some incredibly exciting things that, that, that are occurring already. Yeah. Dave, anything to add? Cool. I think we had a, there's a similar, you know, there's a question while we're carrying on with this about benchmarking has been used in the space to drive increased restoration. Would this be beneficial, Sean? Benchmarking of what? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Or ask Mr Anonymous. It would be, yeah, benchmarking is hugely beneficial. If you can have some good operators and you can see how they operate compared to you, that's, that's really helps people drive, their, drive what they're doing. So, yeah. but, but first of all, you need to know what you're trying to benchmark. It needs to be valuable. Needs yeah. to be the right benchmark. Are there examples of benchmarking overseas or other in other areas that we could adapt? No, probably not easily. No. No. So, okay. but there are there are a lot of um, activities. Farmers are, are constrained in different um, countries for all sorts of different ecological reasons, and some of them have much more positive impacts than others. In some countries, um, farmers are required to leave entire nature strips next to waterways, so that you've actually got channels where nature can travel without having to cross farmland and so there, there's all sorts of th things other countries are trying to do. Yeah, David. I think I'll make a couple of comments on there. I think um, what I mentioned before about extension being really important, I mean farmers can't benchmark or community groups can't benchmark without having the right information so getting really good extension out there is, is really important. I think the other thing that goes with that though as well, I think this comes back to what I was saying earlier on about Having, needing to add value to our, our farm and forest products in New Zealand to get a higher price. We've got to be able to show that we're actually doing what we say we're doing. And I, I think um, really good independent um, auditing um, certification is, is, is essential to actually show that we are getting the benefits for biodiversity of, of the work we're doing across all this part of New Zealand. Cool. Could we incentivise retirement of highly erodible land with more tools than the Billion Trees programme? So I, I, think, um, I think that would be a great opportunity. There's, a, there's still a significant amount of land that, that's attempting to be farmed that's not actually that productive. And if you were to break that farming asset base up and put that land aside, the farm would actually be more financially viable not having to actively manage that block of land. So... <laughs> Thank you. 
and um, and huge opportunity there, I think. Yeah. So if that government can double or triple one billion trees um, and put it all in, in natives, it's going to be win-win for everybody. So it leads really nicely into the next question, Peter. How do, how do people have a say on shaping the biodiversity strategy? And uh, are you looking for ideas like that? Ah, uh, yes. Um, and thank you, Andrea. So, um, yes, so essentially we will launch a discussion document, fingers crossed, depending on cabinet processes, um, in July or August. Um, and there'll be a couple of months for consultation. Um, so it'll be an online consultation you can respond to directly, um, no matter who you are. But we'll also be travelling around the country, um, essentially, with, for a series of sort of public meetings and, and various other bits and pieces. So um, you know, keep an eye on the kind of DOC website and we will... We will kind of be out there very, very soon with some quite big fundamental questions seeking. So the, the nature of the strategy, I'll just, I'll just ramble a little bit more, is we're looking at something which is probably going to be a sort of high-level framework and then a living document, an ongoing rolling series of actions. So here's what the distant future looks like. Here's what the next five years looks like. Update, update. One of our big learnings from the 2000 strategy is you can write a document, get everyone very enthusiastic, sits on a desk, gets a bit dusty after five years, everyone forgets about it, never returns to it. So how can we build something which actually captures people's imagination and keeps this conversation going on an ongoing basis? Yeah. Stop. So feedback opportunities soon. I want to use that question to um, ask a few of my own, and that is around the role of our treaty partners. Uh, so how do we properly reflect the role of the treaty partner in not only restoration planning, which is probably a good question for you, Dave, but also how is the role of the treaty partner going to be reflected in the biodiversity strategy for you, Peter? I'll start with you, Dave. Um, I guess it's um, probably the easiest way to explain it is, is um, using... Um, the notion of a waka uh, model. So that's a twin-hulled waka, uh, where we have one treaty partner in one hull and the other treaty partner in the other hull. And the mahi that happens in each hull um, complements what happens in the middle. So the shared resources, the shared knowledge, the shared um, development and outcomes are all shared in the middle. And uh, we need both, both teams in each hull to actually be going in the same direction at the same time, at the same pace, uh, with the same purpose. So that's probably the best way I could explain what that treaty partnership would look like, but also still maintaining, enabling and resourcing uh, from the flax roots up. So I think um, two key ways. So you'll, you'll get to see soon how we've tried to reflect in the discussion document. But uh, you know, so two two key aspects, um, and that, that's a that's a beautiful analogy and a brilliant analogy. So one is TR Māori and sort of building that into the way in which we articulate the strategy and kind of choose the actions we want to take. So we're particularly struck, for example, in the way in which TR Māori kind of really incorporates the nature and people in a kind of nice kind of sing, you know, single kind of kind of you know concept, um, which kind of you know takes us away from the previous biodiversity versus people, kind of social, cultural versus environmental. Um, so, you know, and, and our understanding of the environment and the state of biodiversity. So hopefully you'll see in which way we try to take TR Māori kind of, you know, through the, through the discussion document, through the strategy. And the other has to be around decision making. So kind of one of our big questions is um, likely to be, so you recognise that kaitiaki role, um, and kind of, you know, both at a kind of national and a, a kind of regional specific level, how does that actually factor into the nature of the decision making and how government makes decisions? So lots of models around now in a conservation context, because um, obviously land is currently in conservation land, has a lot of history, generally speaking, a lot of close relationships with um, with, with the on the ground. So lots of particular models are the kind of ways we can learn from those models and apply them to kind of decision making both around conservation and biodiversity more generally. So we talk about um, obviously the role of um, tangata tiriti and tangata whenua. What about the rights of nature in the biodiversity strategy? And maybe Dave, you might want to even elaborate on this. So how do we honour the rights of the whenua and the rights of the why in our strategies and in our planning and our decision making? Um, I guess that's probably a responsibility for mana whenua um, to actually share that understanding more in these types of forums and at place, um, sharing what our connection means to our whanaunga in the Ngahere, in the Wai and in the Moana. Um, but I guess um, probably the best way to sort of um, explain that would be um, taking a, 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 um, a shift from restoration for conservation to actually restoration for sustainable harvesting is probably the goal for myself and, and um, mana whenua. Yeah. 
Anyone else want to comment? No, I'm mindful that we are running down on time and that not everyone has access to the app, as Stacey said. Is there any questions from the floor from anyone? Feel free to yell out or to um, let us know if you have a burning question and you don't have access to the app. Um, I wanted to elaborate, and Dave, probably I'll start with you as well, on a comment that Aroha made yesterday around putting people back in the environment and the, the conservation philosophy, which is kind of a lock it up and leave it and extract people from that from that process and how that doesn't seem to be working. Mm. Um, do you want to comment on you know the connection that Māori have or mana whenua, tangata whenua have to the land and what maybe our, you know, your aspirations are, your hapu and your iwi in terms of regaining access to your lands? Or? Sure, huge, huge. <laughs> um, I'll try and touch on it uh, briefly, but um, I guess in the context uh, of um, kaitiaki on, on the, the ground, um, it's a hard battle. It's a very hard battle on the different impacts uh, on the land and in the way. And so, um, so <coughs> a lot of it's voluntary and we have a lot of community groups that um, carry out this mahi voluntary. I mean, an example would be a kaumatua um, is up at five o'clock in the morning reading reports. He's off to school to teach during the day. After school, he's off to hui, um, you know, and then, and then scoping more reports after that. So on a voluntary basis, and that's our elders, you know, that's our kaumatua that are carrying out this mahi. And so, you know, there's a lack of, um, of good resourcing to help the next generations come through. Um, there's a lot of talent that we already have, as we can see throughout this room and at place. And so I guess one of the key things that drivers, especially through the Coyote Dieback Program, is uh, to enable, um, you know, that capacity building uh, for, for mana whenua and community groups uh, to be able to make a difference on the ground. Um, the connection that we have to our whenua is a whakapapa connection. We whakapapa to the Coyote, we whakapapa to the Ika. Um, and uh, we have a responsibility, and it's a big mamai at the moment, you know, especially with the Cody dieback is probably the best example at the moment. Um, you know, that's our rangatira, that's our, that's our tupuna that's um, not looking good for him, so there's a sense of urgency, there has been a sense of urgency for generations in regarding to uh, bringing that balance back, so it's a big, it's a big hard task, and uh, um, it shouldn't be just left up to us, it, it's left up... You know, we need to share that mahi across all of us that are, that are obviously here for the purpose in this room. So, so kō tato. Oh, kia ora, Dave. And, and we certainly feel the mamai, the, you know, that responsibility and that, that sadness that we have. But I, and I also want to reflect that back to the farming community, because, Sean, you touched earlier on the mental health issues for our farming community and the mamai that they may feel given, you know, the finger pointing that goes on. So is there anything, you know, you want to elaborate on in terms of um, how, do we, how do we come together, um, be more respectful and mindful of Andrea's um, talk this morning about inclusivity and diversity in terms of healing some of those, you know, wounds between the public's perception of the environment and what they think the industry are doing? Um, I think uh, there's opportunity just around champ starting to talk about some of the good actions. So, so um, we, we still need to highlight issues and, and talk about that stuff. It doesn't need to be uh, so, such a strong finger-pointing process. Probably farming lobby groups don't always help uh, when they're very defensive. So, you know, we do have we do have um, opportunities, with business um, and programs like Country Calendar where we talk about good things. But um, I think I think there just needs to be more of it. We need to to, to intru uh, bring those people along to, to discussions and 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 try and increase increase the opportunity for that. Yeah. It is challenging though. A lot, a lot of these people work. You know, long, long hours every day, and and so, and, and they're they're remote, and yeah, yeah so and it's I, a big challenge. Yeah, and I'm going to hand over to David to answer probably one of those top questions. But I just wanted to one more thing, Sean. I heard, um, and I don't even know if it's true, but I heard a wee while ago from um, a farm representative that that even farmers' children are struggling in school, being bullied for you know polluting the waterways and getting the finger pointed. So are those kinds of things happening in the farming community are they actually, or are they just stories that we here, where farmers are, you well, know, like our teenage crew getting finger pointed. I've got children at school, so at primary school, and it seems to me that they get bullied for all sorts of reasons. So the, the potential is high, especially if you've got a community that's that's mixed and there's urban and rural. 
that especially yeah, if, if it's in the media and, and people are talking about it a lot, I can see that that would be an issue. Yep. Mm. Yeah. David, do you want to give a go at the top one there? How do we ensure yeah. carbon farming and one billion tree incentives yeah. don't result yeah. in our farming landscape being covered in pine trees? Which is certainly not what <laughs> I want to see. <laughs> um, I think um, Cabinet did say in their, um, their directive about one billion trees, was it someone else here might know, I think it was two thirds are supposed to be native. Um, I hope that follows through and actually on the ground planting, but I mean that, that to me is the answer. Te Urako just say we will only fund um, so much in plantation, the rest has got to be native, and the more native the better from my point of view. Yeah. There is a challenge on yeah. top of that around carbon credits and, yeah. and how they're valued. Mm. And so yeah. the speed at which we can grow pines means that they're a more valuable resource for a, you know, a financially focused business. Mm. I, I think that's a challenge that needs to be addressed. Peter. Uh, I thought I'd just, I'd just add is obviously the one billion trees incentives and carbon farming doesn't sit within a vacuum. So there is a thing called the RMA, there is a thing called the National Environmental Standard on Plantation Forests that is being reviewed to kind of ensure that the biodiversity elements of it are kind of strong. So, um, you know, so the intent, the you know, minister certainly expresses right tree, right place, um, right time. So, you know, so I think I think there are there are a few backstops which mm. help to prevent things like this. Oh. What is the role of farm environmental plans in shifting the dial to restoration? How would you like to see these used in the future? I'll answer that one. Go. I'm, a, I'm a, great comp a great proponent of farm environment plans. I think they've got a really fundamentally important role. I mean, sheep and beef has said they want to see every farmer, every sheep and beef farmer in New Zealand have a farm environment plan by 2021. I think that was a, a next generation plan. I think that was a way too ambitious target. But I think the intent's really good. And I think every farmer in New Zealand needs to have a plan where biodiversity isn't something that sits over there and they've got their finance and their fertiliser plans over here. But it actually needs to be right in the middle of their farm plan. So to me, a farm environment plan is actually a, a whole farm management plan in which biodiversity is central to it. So I think it's really important. Yeah. Mm. Anyone else? And I think this is probably a really good question to even sum it up and for us to, to close on. There's been lots of talk about shifting the system in the last few days. What is the one thing we could do that would have the greatest impact on system shift towards restoration? And it'd be good if all of you could have a So I'll response. start by saying purchasing decisions. So the, all these guys run businesses. It's actually consumers that drive behaviour for, for business owners. And so purchasing decisions is the one thing that can drive change. I think uh, um, what I said very early on about um, we've got to develop a, a culture of, of respect and, and, and support and, and, and trust between all the different players. I think that's fundamentally important. Yeah. Yeah. Peter, what's one thing we could do? So I'll focus on the bit that I think we're least confident about yeah. um, and I think the bit that we're least confident about is that economic, economic shift that I think Vicky Robertson talked about yesterday and you've talked about quite a lot of the kind of around the last hour or so what what does the transition path look like so what's the what's actually kind of the A to B and what are the steps in between so that's the bit there's some economic incentives how it all stitches together with that sort of bottom up stuff top down stuff the role of regulation that big picture I still don't have in my head so if someone could explain that bit to me that would be great. We'll try. I think Dave. for me it's um, communication, actually, at all levels. Yeah. Oh, kia ora koutou, uh, nga mihi, uh, mō tō kōrero, um, hō mai te paki paki mō te kai kōrero. Kia ora koutou katoa, and Please accept these koha and enjoy them and remember this day. And when we're talking about communication, have a karo bite then. And that's a nice way for us to end because I've really enjoyed the breadth and the depth of the communication that you've all shared over the last couple of days. And I guess uh, if I can just share briefly, uh, my six year old is a Maori speaker. Um, primarily, and, and her English is quite good, which is good too. Uh, but they are Māori speakers, and we brought up as Māori speakers, and she was playing in the surf at Whangamata, and we were talking about it at night, and I was saying, you love this so much. Um, you know, what, what are you feeling? And she said, ka korero au ki te moana, ka korero mai te moana ki au. I speak to the moana, and the moana speaks to me, and I think that's one form of communication uh, that we can listen to as well. What is the whenua telling us? that we need to not only open our ears and eyes, but also our hearts too as well. And now we open up our puku uh, to lunch. This is our last break, and then we come back and we have just a few more hours together, so let's enjoy that time and make sure that you network with the person that you've been planning to in this short session. And so uh, to 
to ensure we bless our kai, we will have matua tohe tēnā koe, uh, tēnā koa hara mai ki te whakapai i ngā kai. Uh, kia ora tātou, uh, hoi noe mihi atu nga rā ki ngā kai kōrero i kōrero tīmata te ata nei tainu mai ki tēnei wā, e mihi atu nga tēnei uh, kia koutou katoa. Uh, tai atu rā kia koutou i aka tuku mai ngā pātai, ke mohe o te mua te muri o ngā pātai katoa. Nō reira ngā mihi, ngā mihi. Nō reira ke whakapaingia wa tātou kai. Nō reira, whakapaingia e rā ini kai e oranga mō mātou tīnana. Whāngai e wā mātou wairua ki te taro o te oranga. Ko hi ukraiti hoki to mātou kai whakaora. Āmeni.